Hello and welcome to Lowell Observatory. My name is Ariel and I'll be giving you a tour through Lowell today. Now this observatory was founded back in 1894 here in Flagstaff, Arizona by a man named Percival Lowell. We're still an active research facility and I figured I'd give you a little tour of some of the scopes we have on site. So let's get going. So here we are at the Clark Telescope. This was the first telescope built here on Mars Hill back in 1896. Now, Percival Lowell would sit in that very chair looking through this very telescope to map and study Mars. So the main reason why this observatory was founded way back when was actually to study Mars. A long time ago, Percival saw some research being done by an Italian astronomer, Giovanni Scapadelli, called the Canalis of Mars. Now, Canalis, translated to English, means channels, which are naturally made structures. But Percival read Canalis and thought, oh, canals, like man-made structures. So this led Percival to believe that there were some sort of man-made structures or Martian-made structures on the surface of Mars. So Percival decided he was going to build his observatory uh, and build the Clark Telescope to study Mars and to find the aliens. So the reason why we are here today was to find the Martians. Now, this was common knowledge throughout the scientific community. Like, oh yeah, there's, there's aliens on Mars, there's Martians on Mars. Up until the 60s, when we actually visited Mars, we had the Mariner missions go and fly past Mars and actually get pictures of Mars' surface. And we found that there weren't any little green men, there weren't any Martian civilizations or canals. And what Percival was seeing was actually the backs of his eyes. He was just straining his eyes so hard that he was seeing the veins in his eyes. However, uh, again, we still do active research here at Lowell Observatory, and Percival's research on Mars sprouted this whole sci-fi fascination with aliens and Mars, like Marvin the Martian, or Ak Ak Mars Attacks, or H.G. Wells and War of the Worlds, you know, these novels to TV shows to movies uh, were all inspired by Percival and his work. Now, Percival passed away back in 1914. However, the telescope continued being used for research. Specifically, it was used by Vesto Slipher, the director who took over after Percival passed away. Vesto Slipher uh, was studying distant galaxies. So he had a spectrograph mounted onto the Clark Telescope, kind of looks like a space saxophone. And the spectrograph would look at these galaxies and it could actually show what these galaxies were made out of, what elements these galaxies were made of. So these elements on the periodic table. So you'd look at these stripes in the spectra and this rainbow looking spectra, and it would tell you, oh, there's hydrogen in here and oxygen and, and you know, helium in these galaxies. So Vesto was studying these distant galaxies and he saw that there were these lines uh, for, you know, the, the spectra, these elements, and they were shifted to the red a little bit. So they was like, okay, that is hydrogen, but it's just shifted a little bit over there. Why is that? And looking at all these galaxies, all of these galaxies looked to be red shifted. And there was one galaxy that was blue shifted, and that was the Andromeda galaxy, the closest neighboring galaxy to our Milky Way. And Vesto didn't understand what he was seeing. He was seeing, you know, the, these, this red shift, this blue shift, so he went and he presented his findings at a conference. And at the end of his presentation, he got a standing ovation. And a young man came up to him and said, hey, I love your research. Can I, you know, build off of it? And Vesto goes, oh, sure, Mr. Hubble. And a little while later, Edwin Hubble came out with the theory of the expanding universe. So that theory, that knowledge that the universe is constantly expanding started here in this room. And we just didn't know it at the time. Now, in the 60s, this telescope, the Clark, was recruited by NASA to help map the moon for the Apollo program. So we had astronomers come up and put motion picture cameras on the end of the telescope to take pictures of the moon. And then we had airbrush artists. We had artists take these images and make them a little bigger because your human eyes can see more detail than a camera can. So the reason why we landed where we did over 50 years ago on the moon is because of this telescope. Now, this telescope stopped being used for research around the late 70s, early 80s, just because it's a little outdated. However, still to this day, it is used for public outreach and education and viewing. Now, how exactly does this telescope work for viewing? First thing we'll do is open up those four shutters back there. 
The two top shutters open with a pull of those ropes connected to that ladder, and the two bottom shutters open with a press of a button. Once those shutters are open, we'll open up the lens caps on the tops of the telescopes. The main Clark lens cap is way at the top there. The 12 inch lens cap is down here. The six inch is down here. And all of the other ones you can just kind of take off with your hand. Once that's done, we'll put in the name of whatever object we want to look at in this neat little kind of magic box over here called NGC Max. NGC stands for New General Catalog, and that's like a catalog of really cool deep space objects. There's also catalogs like the Messier Catalog. So if we want to look at some objects, all we have to do is select the catalog that we want to use and then the object number. And then on NGC Max, it will tell us how many units this way and how many units this way we have to push the telescope so that that object is in at least one of these finder scopes. So these finder scopes, since they're smaller than the main 24 inch telescope, the field of view is gonna be wider. So rather than being super duper zoomed in in a really small portion of the sky, we're not super zoomed in and it's a larger you know, portion of the sky. So if the NGC Max tells us to move the telescope in this direction, and then that object should be in the main scope and it's not, then we'll look through the finder scope. So rather than looking at this itty bitty little area of sky, we're gonna look at a bigger area of sky. So, you know, let's say I can't see something through the 24 inch telescope here, but I can see it through the 12 inch telescope back here. Then what I gotta do is I'll use these fine adjust knobs back here and very carefully, very slowly move the telescope with those so that that object will be centered in the 24 inch telescope. If I were to take this telescope and just push it, I'm light years off now. That's how close up, how up close and personal we can look at these objects. So once that object is nice and centered in the main 24 inch telescope, uh, the telescope will start tracking. So the scope is gonna start moving every second based off of the Earth's rotation. And that's good because if that telescope wasn't moving, I'd have to manually move the telescope every like 30 seconds to make sure whatever object we were looking at didn't move out of frame. And that'd get kind of annoying. So we have an automatic drive that does it for us. And they definitely didn't have anything like that back in the 1890s. So it's been updated a little bit since then. Once we've moved the telescope to the general area of where the object should be, we will rotate the dome. We rotate the telescope dome with a press of a button on this little remote down here. And this whole inverted bucket shape, this ponderosa pine inverted bucket, rotates on top of these 1949 Ford Business Coupe tires. So with a press of a button, those tires will stay in place and rotate in place, and those shutters will rotate around to be open in whichever direction of the sky we need those shutters to be open in. And now we are going to go and make our way over to the Pluto Discovery Telescope. Percival Lowell passed away back in 1914, and one of the last research projects he worked on was actually trying to find Planet X, or the ninth planet in our solar system. Now this hunt didn't necessarily begin back in you know, the 1900s when you may have believed it to start. This search for this ninth planet really started back in the 1600s. And even before then, you know, for thousands of years, humans would look up into the night sky and we'd see these stars rising in the east and setting in the west. And old ancient astronomers started seeing these other brighter dots that were moving kind of in their own way across the night sky in their own little line. So they didn't think they were stars. They, Greek astronomers called these objects wanderers, and that word translates to planets. So we knew of Mercury through Saturn. We can see Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn all with our naked eye. And it wasn't until the invention of the telescope back in the 1600s when we were able to see a little bit more. So back in 1781, a European astronomer by the name of William Herschel discovered the seventh planet in our solar system. And that is the first of our ice giants, everyone all together, George. George, that's a dumb joke. No, for real, uh, before Uranus was called Uranus, it was called George. So William Herschel wanted to name it after his king, so King George. And there was like two, two decades of argument over what we should name this new planet. Some people were like, oh, let's name it Herschel, because Herschel sounds so much better than George. Uh, eventually, they decided to name it after the god of the sky, Uranus. 
So they discovered Uranus. They were studying this planet, and they found these weird little abnormalities in the orbit of Uranus, these little dinks in the orbit that didn't make any sense. So this led some scientists to believe, okay, there must be an eighth planet way out there in our solar system. So back in 1845, a French mathematician started trying to predict where this eighth planet should be just by using math. And he sent these calculations into observatories around Europe. The National Observatory of Berlin said, okay, you know, we'll, we'll look at these, these calculations for you. We'll point our telescopes in that area of the sky. And they found Neptune that very same day within one degree of where it was predicted to be in the night sky. Now, a single degree in the sky, if you hold your fingertip and arm's length away, the tip of your finger is about a single degree. So this guy was a nerd. So we found Neptune. We're studying this planet and we find more abnormalities in the orbit of Neptune. So this led an American astronomer, Percival Lowell, to start searching for this ninth planet. There must be some ninth planet out there that's messing with the orbits of Uranus and Neptune. Now, Percival Lowell, the founder of Lowell Observatory, had a bachelor's degree in mathematics. He also had his own observatory. So he did the same types of calculations that Leverrier did trying to predict where this ninth planet should be. But again, Percival passed away in 1914, not having found his planet. The man who ended up discovering Planet X, or now known as Pluto, is Clyde Tombaugh. Now, Clyde Tombaugh was a uh, born to a, a family of farmers in Illinois. And uh, growing up, he said one of his, his biggest inspirations was Percival Lowell. Now, where do these timelines ma mesh up? Uh, Clyde Tombaugh, the first 10 years of Clyde's life, he was born in 1904, coincide with the last 10 years of Percival's life. He, was born, he died in 1914. So Clyde, you know, looked up to this Percival guy. Clyde went to school, he went to high school, graduated high school, and really wanted to go to college to study planetary sciences, kind of like, kind of like a Percival Lowell, to be something like Percival Lowell, but his family couldn't afford to send him to college. So instead, he uh, built his own telescopes out of old car parts and farm machinery. And then uh, he started sketching the planets, just like Percival did. And after a little while, Clyde thought he was getting pretty good at sketching the planets. So he sent his sketches into one of the first observatories founded in the U.S. for planetary sciences, and that's here at Lowell. So he sent his sketches in to the director at the time, who was Vesto Slifer. And at this time, the, the end of the 1920s, Vesto was building the Abbott Lawrence Lowell Telescope, which is now more commonly known as the Pluto Discovery Telescope. And Vesto was looking for someone to operate this telescope. So Vesto gets these, these uh, pictures from Clyde and he opens them up and he sees the most astonishing planetary sketches he'd ever seen in his life. They were like Harvard graduate good. So Vesto offers Clyde Tombaugh a job at Lowell Observatory and Clyde accepts. So Clyde's job was to operate this telescope. So every night, he'd walk up this path, he'd go upstairs into this telescope dome, and he would take images. Let's go in there. Now, taking pictures with a telescope sounds a little funky, but this telescope is called an astrograph, kind of meaning like a space camera. So Clyde would take large glass plates, like really big glass pieces, and he'd slide them into this part of the telescope. And then he would look through this bottom portion of the telescope there, kind of like the finder scope, and he would center it on like a bright guide star. And then we would take a two hour exposure of the night sky based off of those calculations and that math that Percival did decades before Clyde even worked here. So Clyde would take these long exposures of the night sky, making sure the telescope stayed focused on all of these stars. And then in the mornings, he would look at these images and he'd compare them and a device called a blink comparator. So he would take two images of the exact same area of sky, exact same star field. And stars don't move within like an eight day period, right? They barely move within a thousand year period for, from us here on earth. But planets, they move, they move pretty close. It's kind of like when you're driving on a road and you see the mountains moving in the background, they move a lot slower than trees on the side of the road because the trees are a lot closer. So here, trees are kind of like the planets. Planets are a lot closer than stars are, so they move really fast. And mountains are kind of like stars, so they're really, really far away, so they're not going to move as fast. They're going to move pretty slow. So Clyde looked at all of these dots and see to see if a single dot moved. So he'd analyze like 250,000 dots a day to see if a little dot in this field of view was planet X. Now, Clyde was hired in January of 1929, 
and Clyde Tombaugh found Pluto in February of 1930, only 13 months after working and searching for Planet X. Now, Clyde became the youngest person ever to discover a planet, the third person in history ever to discover a planet, and the first American and only American ever to discover a planet. Now, we've discovered Pluto back in February of 1930, but we didn't announce to the world, hey, we found your planet X until March 13th of 1930, because March 13th is Percival Lowell's birthday. Now, we let the public name this planet. You know, we said, hey, we found your planet X and you guys get to name it. So we got you know, telegraphs from all around the world saying, oh, you should name it Eureka because you finally found it. Or you should name it Billie Jean. Or you, know, you should name it after the, the very last word in the dictionary. Uh, but one uh, suggestion stood out to us from an 11-year-old uh, English student, a girl from England named Venetia Burney saying, hey, this planet, it's so dark and distant and cold and gloomy, just like the Roman god of the underworld, Pluto. So I think you should name your planet Pluto. And we were like, you know, that kind of has a good ring to it. Also, PL, the first two letters of Pluto, happen to be Percival Lowell's initials. And if you've ever seen the, the planetary signs, all of the planets uh, and our moon and our sun and our solar system have planetary symbols. Pluto's planetary symbol is a P that turns into an L. So not only does it stand for Pluto, it also stands for Percival Lowell. Now, Pluto was demoted to be a dwarf planet back in August of 2006. Now, what's the dealio? You know, why is everyone bullying Pluto? Basically, we started discovering objects just like Pluto, way on the outskirts of our solar system, these tiny little ice balls, billions of miles away from the sun. So we're like, okay, do we have 12 planets? Like, what, what do we do? What's the dealio? So the International Astronomical Union, the IAU, basically the space police said, no, 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 no fun allowed. We're putting laws down on what is and is not a planet. So they decided on three rules that ended up reclassifying Pluto as a dwarf planet. Rule number one is you have to orbit the sun, which Pluto does. Rule number two is you have to be kind of spherical. And Pluto is kind of spherical. Uh, but rule number three is where Pluto fails. And rule number three is you have to clear the area of your orbit or clear the neighborhood of your orbit. And what that means is Pluto, he's tiny. Like if you took Russia and put Russia into a sphere, that's about as big as Pluto is. So he's not a big old gravitational bully. He can't pull in all of these hundreds of thousands of Kuiper Belt objects to become moons or pull them in to smash into its surface to become a larger planet. Therefore, Pluto does not clear the area of its orbit. So it was demoted to be a dwarf planet. I'd also like to mention that the farthest humans have gone in our solar system is like the moon, right? Maybe Mars in, in 20 years, maybe you guys will go to Mars, right? Maybe mm. it's Pluto. Clyde Tombaugh's ashes are currently on the New Horizons mission. Clyde Tombaugh, the guy who discovered Pluto, he is riding on the New Horizons probe, which is the first and only probe that ever flew past Pluto. Now, if you love space and if you love astronomy and someday want to stand somewhere like where I'm standing today, don't be afraid to just jump in. I started volunteering at Lowell back when I first moved up to Flagstaff for college about four years ago, and I've been working here since then, and I have loved every single second of it. I love the fact that I learn new things every day, and I love the fact that I look up for a living. Now, it's important to study STEM subjects like science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and I promise you, math really isn't as hard as you think it is. It's also important, if you'd like, to volunteer and participate in local science clubs and science centers or observatories nearby. Now, I wanna thank you for letting me take you on this tour today. Thank you for having such a curious mind and keep looking up.